everyone. Uh, my name is Yuri. As you see, my email is yburda at math.com. I will be an instructor for Math 104, that's differential calculus with applications to life sciences and nerves. Uh, I will give long hours every week, two hours on Tuesday and two hours on Thursday. So this next to Tuesday, our next to Thursday. It will be in LSK. It's uh, not very far from here. So LSK room 126D. So uh, there's a very small problem with this room. It's kind of behind two separate doors, and uh, I will keep the inner door always, always open, the outer door, I mean, I don't have full control over it. So if, if you come and the outer door is closed, just knock hard. So, uh, at least carefully. Uh, other thing, uh, so there will be, well, we'll have the code and uh, break down the final mark for each one of you. It will be based, 50% of the final mark is based on the final exam. The date is not fixed yet. It's somewhere between December 5th and December 19th, I believe. But nobody knows when exactly. Uh, so that's the final. Then we'll have two meters. Each worth, each, each is one hour, worth 15 marks. And they will be on October the 4th and November the 8th. Uh, so if you miss one of the midterms for a good reason, you are sick and you should bring a doctor's note that tells well the student was not able to attend such and such and such, 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 such day. If for some reason you miss two midterms, you have to talk to the uh, math office. Uh, it's in general, well, it's a pretty bad situation if you miss two quizzes because we are not allowed to shift too much of the grade towards the final exam. So if you miss one quiz, just the final exam will be worth 65 marks instead of 50% for you. But if you miss two, then we have a problem. Uh, then you have a 15% for homeworks. They are based, they are web based. You just go to the website and you well, log in using your campus live login and do your homework. And finally, you'll have some very short quizzes on Thursday lectures. We'll uh, have four of them, September 20th, 27th, October 18th, and November 1, first. Uh, they're just 10 minutes from the end of the lectures on Thursdays. And they're worth total five marks. And the breakdown is as follows. The best two quizzes so there will be one problem in each quiz, so you can either kind of fail or pass it. Well, the two best ones are worth two marks each, the next one is worth one mark, and the last one is, is worth nothing, which means, so basically you can get, if you pass three, three quizzes, you get five marks, if you pass two, two quizzes, you get four marks, if you pass just one of them, you get two marks. I hope that at least people will pass this one. Uh, okay, there is a website for the course with very detailed policies about what is allowed in the course, what is not allowed in the course, a course syllabus, course outlines, learning goals for each week. So it's a pretty good website. Um, you'll be using this book. It looks like this. Briggs and o Cochran, Calculus Early Transcendentals. Uh, I will be using third edition, but uh, I mean, if you have, for some reason, an older edition, it's kind of okay. The only thing you should, I mean, every week we'll have some suggested problems from the book, and you should check that uh, the numbers of the problems are the same in your edition and in the new edition. So I didn't check every single problem, so some of them do diverge. So ask your friend with a new edition and check that the numbers are the same. But otherwise, the material is the same. Uh, okay, yeah. So, any questions about the admission? Yeah, so should we do it? Oh, 
books of philosophy well, I mean, if you want kind of try to find what, what I'm talking about during the lecture, you might want to, but they, I, I mean, I don't think it's really what it is yet. I will be trying to be self-contained and hopefully help you. Talk later, uh, so, I mean, yeah, you, you don't have to bring calculator here, and uh, I believe that on midterm and the uh, final exam you will not be allowed to use a calculator, but for homework, yes, they can do use a calculator. And speaking about homework, uh, so there is this web work, which is 15% of the mark. It is kind of a large part of the mark, but not huge. There, is, there are also suggested problems from the book. They are also very important for you to work on uh, because, well, the quizzes and the midterms and the final exam will be based at least 70 or 75 percent on the homework problems. Might be not exactly the homework, the suggested problems, but it will be close enough. So do look at them and, well, you should know that it's unreasonable to expect that you don't work on the problems and then you come to the final exam and well, magically you begin the one country. So usually it doesn't happen, you should look at the problems during the term. The best way is just every week solve the problems. Other questions? Yeah. Um, was it the midterms and the final that was based on the problems in the book or the quizzes? In the so, uh, the official promise is that 75% of the problems will resemble oh. problems. Other questions? So, uh, I guess we'll just start with the course material then. Uh, We'll start with a review of uh, what is not really calculus, it's more of just algebra, what are exponential functions, what are logarithmic functions, and why are they inverses to each other, what does it mean to be to each other. So we'll start with review of exponential functions. changes, well, we're changing some quantity is proportional to the quantity itself. So let me write it down. Exponential. Population at the time 2000, 
for simplicity, is six billion. And how can we model population at other times? So, according to what is written here, the population at 2,000 plus 100 years must be six times two. It will double. It will have oh, 12 billion, according to the model. And then the population at 2,000 plus 200. So when two centuries passed, you will get a population of two square, six times two square. It will double, and then it will double once again. So we have to multiply by four this time. And more generally, our model tells us, well, if t centuries pass, the population is going to be 6 times 2 to the power t. So we have to multiply by 2 t times. And well, uh, of course this model not only can predict what is going to happen in the future, well, as you see here, it can also tell you something about the past. If you want to know what was the population in 1800, then you use t equal to minus 2. And then the model will tell you, well, 100 years ago it, the population was half of what it is now, and 200 years ago it was four times as small as it is now. So you should take 6 and multiply by one quarter, which is, well, exactly 2 to the power negative 2. Or if you see for the first time that 2 to the negative, this expression 2 to the power negative 2, well, for consistency of everything, it must be equal exactly to 1 4. So it is 6 divided by 4. Which is, by the way, not very far from truth. It was about 1 billion. Well, the model is not very correct. So, here we have kind of model, and uh, what is important for us is this factor, 2 to the power t. The growth is exponential. Every time a certain period of time passes, the amount, the quantity, well, gets get multiplied by constant, in this case, 2. So, this situation happens quite often. When you have a well, since we are in this building, when you have a, a reaction, in nuclear reaction, you have lots of, well, when some of the nuclei start to fire, other ones will, will also start to fire, and the more already firing, the more new ones will be fired. Same with, I don't know, radiated decay. But now, uh, well, another thing, yeah, oh, example uh, that will be quite relevant for us in this class is, so let me write another example. If you put if you put money into a bank account, and the bank account gives you a certain interest rate. So the more money you already have in your account, the more money you'll get in the end of each year as interest. And this model is also, well, an example of exponential growth. Because if you don't spend it. So another example of money in bank account. Examples of quite often in the course. We will analyze what happens when there is painting, there is no painting. Uh, <coughs> so, these are the simplest examples. And, well, I'm of course not teaching here a kind of science, I'm not teaching how to construct the models, I'm only teaching mathematics, which is, well, how to write 
such expressions and how to work with them. So we'll just make a mathematical abstraction. So kind of abstraction of all this story. And we'll say that uh, such a function which takes x and outputs some number raised to power x is called exponential function. any number could be two like it is here, it could be one half. For example, if you take, if in this example, instead of keeping your money in the bank account, you behave in the following way. Every year you spend exactly half the amount of money in your bank account, you have also kind of exponential growth, but this base, which is one half. Today I'll have, well, say, 10,000 in the year. In the end of the year, I'll have 5,000. At the end of two years, I'll have 2,500, and so on and so on. So the amount will half each time. So the only thing which we don't allow is base which is negative. So we always stick with positive bases. I'll, I'll explain why this restriction is important, actually. And so let me remind you some rules how to work with such functions. What is special about them? So rules. One rule. If you take any number and multiply it by itself x plus y times, well, it's the same as taking this number and multiplying it by itself x times, and then multiplying the answer by this number multiplied by itself y times, quite obvious. It's just on both sides if you have a string of x plus y times this. Uh, another rule. What is b to the power of negative x? 1 over b to the power x, right. And you see from this example why it should be 1 over b to the power x. Because kind of in any model of exponential growth to go backwards in time, you should divide instead of multiply. Related to this is such a kind of combination of this <coughs> b to the power x divided by b to the power y. Related to this is the following definition. What is any number raised to power 0. 1. Right. Because it has to be consistent with this formula. b to the power x minus x must be a quotient of b to x and b to x, so it must be 1. It must be consistent with such examples. When t is equal to 0, well, nothing changes. I don't go from 6 billion to any, it should stay 6 billion, so it should multiply by 1. So you see that these rules, well, they are not just something you should memorize, they are reasonable. Another thing, b to the power x, yes. and you compute it, raise it to power y. What is it? You multiply it. Yes, so this b to the power x, y. The reason is, well, here you have b to the power x, you multiply it by b to the power x, multiply it by b to the power x, y times. Well, now apply this rule. What will happen? You should just take b and multiply it by itself, x times y times. Well, related to this is a kind of such example. So what is, I don't know, b to the power of one cup? What does it mean to take something and raise to the power of one cup? Square root, right. Because if you raise this number to power 2, it must be b, according to such a rule. So to make everything consistent, you must say that b to the power 1 half is square root of b. And more generally, b to the power of fraction is the nth root of b to the power n. 
Then, of course, it is useful to have an exponential function not just for integer values of the argument, for all values of the argument. Because, well, we might want to know what is the population in 2012. And, well, 2012 is not 2000 plus an integer number of targets. It's somewhere in between. So it will be useful for us to raise 2 to some power in between. And that's how it, it, we can do it. And finally, if you want to raise b to just any power, which is might be not a corruption, well, we just approximate it by corruption and raise it to the power of this corruption. So actually, exponential functions are defined for all possible arguments. Positive, negative, zero, fractions, rationals, irrationals, whatever. Um, okay, so. Let's try. To see how the exponential function looks like. Let's try to draw it. Draw its graph. Okay, so what is the value of an exponential function going to x equal to zero? One, right. It doesn't matter even what the base is. Any number to the power zero is one. So this point will always be on my graph. Well, Next value is say x equal to 1 will depend on the base. Let's say we are trying to draw 2 to the power x. Well, 2 to the power 1 is 2. 2 to the power 2 is, well, 4. 2 to the power 3 is already quite big. It's 8, it's way up here. So, oh, I can't read it. Let's try negative 1. So as I go to the right at each step, I should double my number. As I go to the left, I should half. I should take half. So here it is one half, two to the power negative one. At negative two, it is one quarter. At negative three, it is one over eight. And well, it becomes smaller and smaller as you go further and further to the left. So the graph looks like this. It grows, it grows quite fast to the right, to the left it decreases. And once it also it decreases quite fast, so here it's almost not distinguishable from zero, but it's never actually at zero. You can't trace a, a number of any power to get zero. So you get such a line. So that's always two to the power. Yes. What happens if I try a different base? 3 to the power x. Well, not really different. At the point 1, I still, at the point 0, I still get 1. But then, instead of doubling at each step, I will be tripling my numbers at each step. So here, I will already be at 3. Here, I will be at 9. So it will be growing even faster. And for the same reason, it will be decreasing even faster here. So it will be one third here, one over nine here, and so on. So that will be three to the power x. Okay. So the question: How would the graph of one half to the power x look like?
doesn't look like exponential at all. And it is actually not really an exponential. It is just a constant number one. For every value of s, you get one. So for any base which is greater than one, the function is growing. For any base which is smaller than one, the function is decreasing. Um, I won't really tell you now the true reason why, why we're introducing some special base, but we'll introduce now a special base called the number e. So the number e has the following funny property. So we see that the base has an impact on how fast my function is growing. And one way to measure how fast the function is growing is by how steep is its tangent line. So we can take a tangent line at any point and ask, well, how steep it is? Okay, this is slow. And if you look at these graphs, you'll see that for 2 to the power x, the slope of the tangent at the point 0, x equal to 0, is slightly smaller than 1. For 3 to the power x, it is already slightly, slightly bigger than 1. So somewhere in between, it should have been 1. And the base for which we small is 1, is called e. So if you plot the function e to the power x, this slope will be 1. So I will not explain now why this base is so special. Uh, Basically, because we, we, do, we still aren't solving the problems for which it is actually convenient, but just to introduce it, well, there is some number like this. It is approximately 2.718288283. Well, it doesn't continue this way, it continues so on and so on. Uh, well, so there is some number like this.
very natural question. Then of course for this, well, then and for this it's natural to just solve the equation 6 times 2 to the power t is equal to 4 so 2 to the power t is 2 thirds and so once we write here we don't really I mean all the top of our heads we don't know what t is we know that 2 to the power 0 is 1 a little bit
the new value and f m. Okay, another example. f of x is x cubed. What is of inverse of y? What function would undo cubic? Q group. Q group. So, well, one way to think about this is, as I did, I said that, well, to undo raising to power 3, I should raise the answer to power 1 third. Because, well, x to the power 3 and then raise to the power 1 third gives me x there. Another way to think about it, so let me raise this kind of thing, is well, <coughs> just solving this equation, x cubed is equal to y, it means that x is y to the power of 1 cubed. Just the definition of inverse function. Explanation. Sometimes it might be not that easy. For example, my function is x cubed plus mx plus 1. Now that's a complicated function. If you want to solve an equation f of x is equal to y of x, well, you might try, but you will fail in the first five hours or so. So it is really a complicated function. Whoever we can say something about the inverse. What is well, let me try to compute its inverse at the point uh, 12. What does it mean? F inverse, as I said, undoes the application of f. So what happens is, well, I have this function f. I think about some number x. And then I tell you, I applied the function to the, to, to the number x that I thought about, and I got 12. And your task is, Reverse this procedure. Know what, what is the number x that I thought about. So, anyone?
two. Well, no, I didn't think about two. I actually thought about minus two. Well, now somebody tells, well, then it was minus two. But then I would say, well, no, I actually thought about two. So here I have two possible answers. Two or negative two. Which one is the actual answer? Well, we have no way to know. Just no way to know. Both of them work, but my inverse function must be a function. It should tell if inverse of 4 is either true or negative true. It can't make an arbitrary choice. So it just doesn't exist. So in this case, your inverse doesn't exist. It means I cannot reverse the application of this function. It actually loses information. I can't undo it. So the general observation is like this. If was as follows. It took two different inputs, two and negative two, and it, they got the same out four. So it lose two different values to the same out. That's why you can't find the inverse value of this out. Yeah. If you like set a domain for the function as let's say only positive numbers, would x squared uh, now have a new inverse? Yes. So if instead of this function it has consider just its restriction, <coughs> impose an additional constraint, x is only positive, then it will have an and it will be the positive square root of x. Okay, so here we have kind of criterion for when a function does not have an inverse. We have a name for, it, for the opposite type of situation, once again, it's just a name. Uh, so we say that f is 1 to 1 if x different inputs. So, once again, just a name for the opposite situation. So, if my function takes different inputs and some different inputs and outputs the same output, then it does not have an inverse. The opposite situation is if I know the two inputs are different, then the two outputs are different, well, I just call this function 1 to 1. So the definition is if x1 is different from x2, then f of x1 is different from f of x2. Yeah. Okay, so question is, well, how do I know that the function is actually has an inverse, it's one to one, it's more as the same thing. Uh, well, suppose you are given your function in a graphical form. Somebody well, maybe collects a lot of data and you have a curve. And you want to understand, does this function actually have an inverse? Well, let's try. Here's the graph of this function. It looks somewhat like this. 
here is a graph of a different one. I claim that one of them is invertible, the other one is not, which means one of them has an inverse, the other one doesn't. So how many of you think that this function does have an inverse? How many of you think it does not have an inverse? So it means that all the rest are thinking about different things. So you should start thinking about functions and their inputs. Well, maybe it's simpler to start with this one. How many of you think that this function has an inverse? How many of you think that it does not have an inverse? So let's look here. We should check whether the function takes different inputs and outputs the same output. Well, let's look at this function. <coughs> if you take this output, there is a way to go back to its input. You just look well. What x produced this value of y? Very easy. You take horizontal line like this, and here's the value of x, who's, such that the value of your function is this particular y. So here everything is okay. But if you take such a point and do the same procedure, what value of x produced this particular y? Well, it might be this one. Very good. But it might have been this one. Very good. I have been that one. <coughs> so we have three different values of x which produce the same output y. So there is no way to go back from the value of y to a unique value of x. On the other hand, in this picture, whatever horizontal line you draw, get a unique value of x. So quite easy to go from y value to the x value. So if you just look at the picture, it's quite easy to understand which function is invertible and which is not. So this has inverse, doesn't have
сейчас define the definition would be take the horizontal line corresponding to the value of y and output x. So one very common reason for why we would be in this situation is that my function is just increasing. So if my function happens to be increasing all the time, like in this picture, then I know that if I intercepted a horizontal line at one point, well, I'm not going to come back at another point, because it keeps increasing to the right and it keeps decreasing to the left. So if m is increasing, about decreasing function. <coughs> the source of problems for having for, for finding an inverse is functions like this, which are increasing and decreasing and increasing once again. So such functions quite often don't have any <coughs> Um, how is the graph of the inverse related to the graph of the function? Okay, we will, we will discuss it. We can measure them now. Yeah, but let's discuss it now. So, the question was, if we know the graph of a function, if we are given a function in a graphical form, how do we find a graph of its inverse? I try 
such a function, the one that is decreasing than increasing, say a parabola. Well, let me flip it. If I flip a parabola, I get a parabola in this direction. Is it a graphical function? No. Well, not quite. For every value of x, I have opposite values of x at least. I have two different values of y. It's not close. The definition of a function is it takes the value of x and outputs one value of y. So it's not a function. It's not a graphical function. However, if I restrict my function to just this part, say, say that it's defined only for positive x. Maybe in my problem, x is a mass of something. And it's not reasonable to have an object with negative mass. Then now suddenly my function becomes invertible. Here's the graph of the inverse. So maybe let's do an example of such a thing.
Okay, so maybe any questions about inverse functions? Um, what yeah. if there are other groups in your function? Would it be? No problems. I mean, if, if you have an asymptote, well, basically, of course, just, just no problems. Okay. I mean, same principle applies. So, for example, Right. Some examples. Fx is 1 over x. It looks like this. Right? It has an inverse. Every horizontal line intersects the graph in two points. E in one point. So it has an inverse. If you want to find the inverse, well, either solve the equation or keep the graph. Sometimes a function of this and asymptote might not have an inverse, but for the same reason as it used to be. Such well, for this value everything is okay, but for this value you have two different inputs with the same amount. So basically the same consideration, so no difference. Other questions? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the inverse of this function. Exponential. As I said, it's very really useful when you want to analyze exponential growth models. And, well, because it's so useful, it's got this very standard name, it's called Bobber. <coughs>
make an exponential function that has some rules for how to deal with operators. Let me recall those. logarithm of x times y. <coughs> you can solve this logarithm of x plus logarithm of y. The reason is not that, <coughs> not that complicated. Suppose that you know that to raise b to some <coughs> To get x, you should raise b to some power. And to, raise, to get y, you should raise b to some other power. To what power you should raise b to get x times y? Well, to the sum of those. So this rule is really the same rule as for exponentials, but kind of in reverse. And similarly, there are other rules. <coughs> Four 
n is p equal to 4.
what's good is you can take your calculator and actually compute what is one two and what is one three. There is just one button. So you take two and press one. So using this you can find what it is. It is approximately nineteen forty one. Okay, so I guess that's what I wanted to say today, so 